wanted to do, this is a 30 minute talk, I wanted to share with you an insight I've had uh, recently um, that has to do with uh, assertions. Let me get this right. This thing is, uh, there we go. I think that's better. Uh, assertions, this thing. Um, what uh, happened years ago in Java 1.4 is they added an assert keyword to the language and I wasn't sure what to do with it. I made sense to me to put assertions in tests, but I didn't know how to put them into production code. And I, uh, in those days, I was interviewing, uh, doing a lot of interviews that I, uh, with different people who wrote different books or wrote design languages. And so uh, the Pragmatic Programmer book had recently come out. Um, and that's Dave, uh, Dave Thomas and Andy Hunt wrote that. So I interviewed those guys. And one of the things they talked about in their book was uh, when to use assertions. But they didn't really seem to answer my question, so I asked them in this interview, uh, you know, when, when's the right time to use these things, how should you use them, in your production code. And um, what I described was that the only time I really feel the urge to, to use one is when I'm not 100% sure I understand the, 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 the code. I, it's like kind of complicated, I think I know what it's gonna do, but I'm not 100% sure, so I wanna stick an assert there to sort of say, well, it just, if it ever does happen that it, this, this goes wrong, that it will fail fast. And what uh, Dave, I mean, he had a nice way of putting it, but he said that's, that's a bad idea. Uh, the, the nice way he said that, uh, you know, the, the way he put it is that uh, whenever he finds himself doing that, where he doesn't understand his code, uh, and that's why he wants to put it in a cert, he takes that as a warning bell to step back and refactor the code to, so that he does understand it. And then he dodged the question, he said, and then put in decent asserts. This is like, okay, when to do that. So what this talk is, is about is, is when to do that and why. Um, I think I finally, after this much time, had an, uh, an insight uh, that I wanted to share with you. So uh, the other place that I, I sort of drew in, in, input about like using assertions was uh, the Eiffel programming language, which was designed by a guy named Bertrand Meyer, French guy. Uh, so he named it after the Eiffel Tower. And he had something that he called design by contract, which is a way to specify the behavior of code using assertions. Um, so this is uh, Eiffel code, uh, and it's kind of odd. If you look at that, I mean, I hadn't looked at this in years and years and years, and I noticed, hey, the way you specify a type is you put it after the thing with a colon. And uh, it actually has semicolon inference also, so he may have, uh, basically I think he kind of came up with a lot of things that he doesn't get credit for. Uh, but what you had to do to write a method in an Eiffel class is you had to give three things. There's three sections to the method. There's a section where you define assertions that specify preconditions, uh, what he, a, a kind of assertion he called a precondition, and that's the require block. And what that represents is things that have to be true when that method is called. So it can be either uh, something about parameters that are passed in, or it could be something about the state of the object or the state of the world uh, when you call it. Like sometimes, like if you close a file handle and then try to use it, th then it, that's like you've broken the precondition, right? Um, so that's what the require block is. And then do is when you actually do the method. Uh, and ensure is another set of assertions that runs afterwards, and that's gonna be talking about either the result, if it's returning something, or any side effects it has, you know, it, it would talk about those as well, right? Um, so uh, what this one does, it's a square root method. It takes a real number, which is like double, I would assume. I don't know Eiffel. Uh, and uh, obviously it has to be greater than or equal to zero. You can't take the square root of a negative number. That wouldn't make sense, so that's a precondition. That, by the way, is the responsibility of the caller. So when you call the method, it's your job to make sure the preconditions are established before you call it. Uh, the post condition, what he does is he squares the, the, the result, which is just a magic word you can use in, in, a, in Eiffel. He's got a lot of uh, support for this, this design by contract stuff. So you can just say result, and it is the, the, what was returned from a return statement. Square it, and that should actually give you back what you originally started with, but it might not be it, because of rounding, right? So what he does is he subtracts the original, and that should in an ideal world be zero, but it might not mean it'd be off a little bit, but it might be, you might have rounded up, you might have rounded down, so it could be positive or negative. So then he takes the absolute value, so he knows it's positive and he compares it against some tolerance that he's willing to accept, right? That's his post condition. Um, so you can do that in Scala. 
using a little known method named assume and ensuring. So how many people have heard of assume in Scala? See, not very many. How about ensuring? About the same. So I would say like 10%. And that's because we don't tend to use this, but the reason it's there is so that people who do like uh, design by contract can do it in Scala. It's kind of lightweight. Um, I'm going to show you what they do. I'll give you a demo. I'm going to try to go over here. I think that worked. So I'll say, so basically this is just a, there's nothing imported. I can just say, a, uh, let's make a value, val x equals 1. Um, I can just say assert x is greater than 0, and I get unit. Um, I can say less than zero and I get assertion error. Uh, but I don't get a very nice error message, which is like, it doesn't, you know, you'd have to really do, it'd be nice to know what x is, right? So what you can do is put uh, uh, x was dollar x or something like that. You can put a clue string in here and then that shows up in your log file, right? So assume works exactly the same way. It does exactly the same thing. So I'm gonna go back here and change this assert to an assume, this assert to an assume. You'll get the exact same behavior. The only difference is that assume is intended to uh, do preconditions. And where's the one with the clue string? So one of the things about design by contract in, in Eiffel and assertion sort of traditionally in a lot of languages is that you can turn them off at runtime because these are in your production code and it may take a while to square you know, the result and you don't want to spend that time when, you know, once you convince yourself that the, the, the method works, you, you switch a flag when you compile and it doesn't actually compile those into your bytecode. So a certain assume uh, in Scala will, you can elide them. You can actually set a compiler flag, set the elide level such that those don't even show up in the bytecodes, right? So that's, that's uh, Scala's support for assertions. And then assuring, take a look at ensuring the way it's used here. You basically invoke, you can invoke ensuring on any type and it is going to take the number, the value, in this case it's a number, that you are invoking it on and pass it into the function you pass to ensuring on the other side there. So the function here takes the result um, and it does that same kind of tolerance check. Uh, so let me just give you a demo of ensuring. Uh, it is, so let's say we have 42 and I can call that on it. This is just a, an implicit conversion in pre-def and then what I pass into ensuring is a function that will be passed 42 and if, um, Let's say this should be less than zero. We'll, we'll first make it fail. If the assertion fails, it will give you an assertion error, right? Uh, this is your post condition check. And it, you can also put a clue string in here, right, if you want. And that will show up in your log file. But if the assertion succeeds, then what you actually get back is what it was invoked on. Because you, because you need this to, to be the result so they can be returned, right? So when I, when I call ensuring on 42 and the assertion can succeeds, I get 42 so that it is returned. Okay, so that's ensuring. Does that make sense to people? I'd like you to understand ensuring. So it's a different kind of assertion. It actually returns the, the result it was invoked on. It doesn't just return unit. Okay, so um, what happened is this, these two of these things came about when we were writing chapter 14 of the Programming in Scala book, it, it, way back when, the first edition, because uh, I, uh, there was no ensuring, and so we, there was assume, but there was no ensuring. So Martin invented it, and we put it in, put it into Scala, put it into the book. And then I didn't like assume because this is, uh, you know, on the JVM and the Java culture, so the Java way of doing things is you don't throw assertion error, and you can't elide the precondition checks. What you normally do is say, if something is not valid th th in Java, <gasps> throw new illegal argument exception semicolon, right? That's what you would do, and you would never take it out. And it turns out, that the default elide level in Eiffel was that only precondition checks were enabled. Postcondition checks and invariant checks, the other kinds of checks, other kinds of assertions he defined are just disabled by default. So, it, you know, the default became sort of the culture or the tradition in Java and, and I thought in Scala should do the same thing. So, so we came up with this require word, put into Scala, put into chapter 14. And that's what most people use just because it, it became tradition. Um, there, assume is just mentioned in a footnote <laughs> in that chapter. So, so anyway, require, I'm going to show a quick demo require if you haven't seen that guy. Um, require is the same thing, x less than zero, it returns, uh, oops, x is one. So I just, I just, uh, that was a real assertion error. Uh, I thought it was going to be, succeed. When it succeeds, you get unit, just like uh, with assume, assert, 
but when it uh, fails, you get a legal argument exception. So, um, and you can put a clue string in there if you want. So, uh, the other thing that was tradition in the Java community was it's not just a legal argument exception. The other thing that it can be a precondition is I have called this method when it, this, a method on this object when the object is in the right mood, right? So if you have a file handle, it's very happy until you close it, then it gets very stubborn if you try to use it again, right? It's in the wrong mood, and you get an illegal state exception. So what I had, I suggested Martin is we add a legal, like require state also, and then there was also require non-null because that, that's the other thing you would get out of uh, Java, traditionally, is null pointer exception if something passed in is null. And Martin said that's too many requires. So, um, so that is not in pre-def, but it is in uh, scholastic requirements. I just want to do a quick demo of those. These guys have just imported so those require methods that hide the pre-def ones. So now if I say require uh, this one, um, you get that kind of error message in your log file that you get with a test failure. So it, you don't have to write a clue string, you get a bit of information. Um, if you get the same kind of error message with require state, but it throws illegal state exception. And require non-null is, uh, I'll say s equals high, val t colon string equals null. Uh, see, there, there are use cases for null in Scala to demonstrate require non-null <laughs> s comma t, right? Uh, it just says t was null. So it's just some, some uh, macros that help you get good error messages in your log file. And I think that um, the trade-off of require is that it's good to, I think, explicitly state what your preconditions are, and this declaratively kind of says what they are. It's really easy to read and understand, and to fail fast if it ever happens. You hope it never happens, but um, uh, if it does, you don't want any, the program to go any farther, because essentially the program has detected a bug in itself. The program can't handle fixing that bug. You just need to get out of there, right? Um, the problem is that you've just inserted a partial function in your method, which is like there are values you can pass into it that will not give an, the unit value back. It will actually blow up with an exception. So there's a place your program can blow up. The more of these you sprinkle into your code, it's like it seems like little landmines that could blow up, you know, at some point, right? So the way you can get rid of the require is to try to put it into the type that's passed in. Uh, and, whoops, you know what I forgot? I forgot to go back to ensuring. Let me, let me back up. So what happened here also, this is sort of what we do. This is what design by contract says. Um, what we do is we use require and we don't check the post condition. So instead of checking the post conditions with ensuring, what we do is we check them in tests. And sort of instead of design by contract winning this mind share, battle for mind share, back then unit testing did. That you take, and you took those, put those assertions in a different body of code called your tests, and, um, and then that's where the post condition checks are. So what, what you kind of get, and this is one of the points of design by contract when you have this precondition and post condition check here, is you've, you've actually specified the behavior of this method, that is the spec, and if you think about it, no matter what x is passed in, this has to um, be true to, to, to work. I mean, the precondition has to be met, the postcondition has to be met. Uh, so that actually specifies the behavior of the method inside the method body. But if you take it out to a test, you need a for all. Because if you just have like one or two examples, you're not, basically by saying for all, you're saying no matter what x is passed in, then whenever the preconditions are met, then the postcondition down at the bottom should be true, and the way you get that is you call into the method and get an answer back, right? So, so anyway, I think this is what, what we do. That's the reason we don't use assume and ensuring is because uh, require and tests is what won in the marketplace in Java, the marketplace of ideas, I mean, and in, um, in, in Scala. So, um, so anyway, as I was starting to say, is that uh, I consider require an expression of hope in your code because I hope it will work. But the reason I actually check it is because I'm not convinced it will always work, right? If I would really believed it would always work, I just, why would I say that? Which is the whole point of like, well, why do I put asserts in my code? 
That's the question again. The reason I'm putting this assert here in my code, this requires a kind of assertion, is because I'm not 100% sure it will always work, just like what I told Dave Thomas in that interview, right? Um, so to, what, you know, because that is a place where you can, um, you know, your program can blow up, uh, what, um, what I would like to try to do every time I put a require in there is say, is it practical to put it in the type instead? So instead of passing in double, pass in something for which th the assertion is true about the values of that type, right? So one of the things we've been adding to Scholactic uh, recently is a lot of any vowels uh, uh, that wrap uh, primitive types and string that um, capture common things like posint is a positive integer. So we have one called posy finite double uh, that will, will appear in ver version 3.1, but what that one is, it's either positive or zero, and it's not infinite. Um, it also is not not a number. It's not not a number? It's a number. Uh, it's not, it's in and an. So anyway, that's what that type means, and that's actually what this method needs, right? And I, I say that I think that's an expression of faith because I, I trust it, I believe that it will actually be true that this is a positive number or zero and it's not infinite and, and that it's a double. Um, and because I believe that, then I don't write assert, right? That's why, why, I, that's why there's no assert there is because I believe the types. And so I think types are an expression of faith. Now, since this is uh, the day after type level, you guys may have heard about uh, Curry Howard. Did Curry Howard come up yesterday? Oh, poor Curry Howard, they didn't even talk about him. Them. Uh, so this is an interesting uh, thing uh, that uh, Curry and Howard noticed that there's these two branches of math, there's type theory, there's uh, logic, and that they kind of, you can kind of line them up and they, they map to each other, right? Um, essentially when a type can be viewed as a proposition in, in logic, and a program is, can be viewed as a proof, right? So I think, you know, there's a lot of interest in, in, in proofs for your code. Um, and I think that has value, but um, the, the trouble is that every time there's a system where you are proving something, there are some axioms that you have taken as given, and you basically just take those on faith, right? And so in the real world, those axioms may not actually be true, right? That's the problem. Um, so an example is, uh, that, for example, you may think that a double, when you divide it, it will give you a valid answer. Right? I mean, that's sort of part of my faith in that type is when I call its methods, they work, right? There could be a bug in the Scala compiler or the JVM or the operating system or even the, the chip, right? There was actually a chip called the Pentium uh, that for a while, when you divided these two numbers, it gave you the wrong answer, right? So it's not, just because it's double doesn't prove that it's going to work, but we just ignore that. We just have faith that it's gonna work. Otherwise, we'd have to assert everything everywhere, right? So um, another example is, uh, I don't, I'm not gonna show it, but I will tell you the story. When we ported Scala tests to work with Scala.js, we have some property-based tests for, uh, for our antivals, for like posint, that are gonna be working with integer values. And they kept, on JavaScript, they would occasionally blow up with a not a number and so int, when you divided by zero on Scala.js, would give you double not a number as the answer. The type changed from int to double, which was a bug in the compiler. But that's the thing is uh, you have to remember that when, when you're working with proofs, there's axioms that you are actually taking on faith and they may not actually be true, but we just forget that because otherwise it would be uh, impossible to really do anything. So, um, so anyway, I think that once you put it in the type, it's an expression of faith. And um, what I think really the way I, s a better metaphor for what we do in the real world with programming is science. Uh, there's a quote that's attributed to Einstein that I've heard a bunch of times, which I never could find evidence that he actually said it. Um, but it's a good quote, so I'm gonna repeat it here. Um, no amount of experimentation can ever prove me wrong. A single, it can prove me right. See, that was almost, 
there's maybe that actually illustrates something. I don't know, but no amount. Of, I'm going to read it again. No amount of experimentation can ever prove me right. A single experiment can prove me wrong, right? Um, and I think that the kind of proof we can get with our code uh, is is that it doesn't work. So if there's a compiler error or a test failure, there's a bug somewhere, and it may not be a bug in your code. It may be a bug in the compiler or the test framework, but it's probably a bug in your code. Maybe a bug in your understanding, but there's a problem somewhere. That is like the best actual proof we can get. The rest is, is really uh, taken on faith, but it's actually how we, it's how we approach science. I mean, they talk about uh, scientific consensus. It's just there's been so much evidence that everyone kind of believes this is correct. But it doesn't, you know, it could be wrong, and somebody could find an experiment that proves it wrong. That's sort of uh, what, what faith is. Um, okay. So another um, thing that you might think about now that I've, I've refactored this square root method to take Posey finite double is um, could I return it, right? I mean, if you think about square root, uh, square root always, like if you actually pass it a number that's positive or zero and non-finite, should it not return another number that's positive or zero and non-finite? I think it should. So I'd like to actually return it. Um, what happens here is the math.square root um, takes a double, but I'm giving it a posy finite double. Um, but because every value that is positive, zero, or finite will fit in a double, that's a safe conversion, so we have an implicit widening conversion that just automatically converts it. So it gets converted to double. Because it's an eval, that's just a no-op. Like at runtime, a double is just what's passed in. So it implicitly converts it to double, and then math.square returns a double. So now it's, we've got a double in our hand, and I want to turn it into a, I believe that it's a posy finite, I mean it was a valid posy finite double, because that's how square root works, right? Um, so what you would have to do is add a YOLO method. And a YOLO, I love that name. That means you only live once. It means it's a partial function. When you call it, it may blow up in your face, right? And so I'm going to show you what, what, the, what you had to do in actually the current version of release galactic with these antivals is you have to call from, which gives you back an option, and then you call get on it. So calling get on the option is the YOLO call right there. So let me show you uh, what that looks like. Um, I'll use posint import or dot scalactic dot any vowels dot posint. So if I say posint 42 or 52, um, that just gives you a posint back. And, but if I say negative 42, I get a compiler error because uh, the apply method on posint is a macro that looks at compile time at the literal, at the value, at the expression you're passing in there. If it's a literal, it can prove at compile time that it's always going to work, right? And it so just gives it right back to you. Um, if it's negative, if it's not valid, it will give you a compiler error, so it just won't compile. But if um, it's not a literal, then uh, I'm going to say x is 42. Uh, so x has a new value now. So if I say posint x, I get a compiler error that says, essentially, I can't prove at compile time that this is positive, right? So you're going to have to use this other factory method called from. So what you get with from, so instead of dot apply, which is what I've been calling, I just call dot from, uh, you always get an answer, but it's wrapped in an option. So if it was valid, you get it wrapped in a sum. So here I got sum, pause in 42. If it's invalid, like a negative 42, I get none, right? And the reason I did that was because I, I didn't want to just move the problem. Like require is a hole, I mean a place in your program where it could blow up. I didn't want to just move the problem to the factory method of the anyval. I didn't want to have a method, a factory method, where you, it either will work or blow up with an exception, right? So the trouble is that after many months, yeah, I, I, I kept finding myself in situations like this, including, I realized, I don't know why I never noticed this before I released it, but the macro itself, after the macro proves that you know, the, valid, the number's valid, it rewrites the code of apply to a call to from the same expression, dot get. So I'm just creating an option and throwing it away. And so I thought, well, that's really got to be, this, that's really stupid, and that's the wrong way to do it. So I'm going to have to add a YOLO method. So then I was like, well, what am I going to call it? So what I thought I would maybe call it is unsafe from, that was the leading candidate, because because it's a little longer, a little more verbose, which discourages its use, and it has the word unsafe, which nobody wants to see in their code, and it's truth in advertising, right? 
Um, but then it occurred to me, and this was the insight that uh, like hit me at one point, that this is a lot like insuring in that insuring when you call it on 3.0, it does an assertion, and if, it's, if that assertion succeeds, you get 3.0 back, you get the same value back. And uh, posy finite double unsafe from, when you pass it 3.0, if it passes the, the uh, assertion, you get back 3.0, but with a more narrow type, right? So it's just like an insuring that gives you the same value back if the assertion succeeds, but it's in a new type. Before it was a double, now it's a posy finite double. So you've taken and captured that assertion in the type. Um, so what I decided to name these is insuring valid. So it's a new kind of insuring method. And what they do is they throw assertion error because I realize that this is an assertion. So if I say 42, uh, or, or like, sorry, posy, uh, let's say posint uh, dot insuring valid uh, 42, I get back a posint. If it's minus 42, I'll get an assertion error uh, with, a, uh, with a nice error message, right? So. So that was um, my insight. And then the question, and the next question you might be asking is, have I moved the problem anyway? You know, um, did I just move the yellow problem from required to insuring? And I, I did, but I think it can be better because require is always an expression of faith. But, in, I'm sorry, required, I can't read my own slides. Require, th that guy's like, you're my checker, but this require is an expression of hope, right? because I, I don't have evidence nearby that I know it's always going to work, that convinces me of that. I don't know if it's going to work, and that's why I leave it there. Whereas ensuring valid can be an expression of faith, as long as there's nearby evidence. Um, and so uh, if you look at this, I, even if all my tests pass and I have 100% test coverage, I still would leave that, re and everything works. I have a lot of confidence that I'm no, nowhere in my program are they going to pass a negative number in here. I would still leave that required there, because what if someday someone changes the code, someone else, and doesn't know about it and forgets it and makes a mistake that could happen, right? So I still hope it will never happen. Um, but here in the first example, I just set X to 2.0. I can see it's gonna be valid. And then right after that, I call insuring valid and I pass it in. I have evidence nearby that it's gonna work. So that's why I have faith it will work. Um, and I think that's better than the require. Even if there's more of these than there are the requires. Um, and so that then in, in the uh, bottom there, which I think some of you guys may not be able to see very well, it's, uh, but don't worry, I'll read the slide, um, is that to actually return posy finite double from this method, I just call ensuring valid and I pass the double in. And the reason I have faith that that will always work is because I believe I understand uh, how square root works that um, the square root of positive zero, positive or zero non-finite, non-infinite number is gonna be another positive or zero non-infinite number, right? It's right there. So, um, okay. So basically the, uh, the, what I learned is that there are two kinds of assertions that I think it makes sense to sprinkle all throughout your production code. The first one is precondition checks, uh, and the other is assertions that give you a more specific type back, right? So the, um, the guideline about precondition checks is to minimize them if you can get rid of it. You can basically get rid of all the places where there's hope in your program, where you aren't sure it's gonna work, you just hope it's gonna work. Um, and so every time you write require, I mean, it's good to fail fast, so Every time you write one, think, well, is it practical and simple enough? Is it, is it worth it to try to replace that and put it in the type? Um, and if you use an insuring value, make sure there's, there's evidence nearby that uh, gives you a reason to have faith, right? Base your faith on evidence. And, and basically, you should believe that every insuring valid is always going to work, right? And I think that's uh, better. So before I take questions, I just wanted to mention that Artima is uh, uh, hiring. Uh, we are looking for a business development person, a tech editor, and uh, programmers over time, not immediately right today, but I would be interested. If, you, if you're interested, uh, please email. Uh, or you can talk to me at the conference or email careers at Artima.com if you want to send a resume. And 
I'm ready for questions. Thank you. Yeah, the question was, I, uh, he assumed, he, he's making an assume, that I uh, did not, I on purpose did not make an implicit conversion from um, double to posy finite double, and, and uh, that is correct. So um, the only implicit conversions are the widening ones, the ones that you can, that are safe. Uh, so that's what the ensuring valid is an, is an unsafe conversion going the other direction. Yes. Oh, you mean like refined? Yeah, the refined library is um, a, a different approach. Uh, what, what we have is a bunch of classes that are any vowels. Uh, what refined does is it, it uh, does things at the type level, and it does the same kind of thing. Uh, one difference is uh, ours, I think that has to box unless it's changed, so it may be less of, I mean, there's a, maybe a performance impact. Um, any vowels, the whole idea is they have the same performance as the underlying thing to the extent possible. Um, another one is I think the types are simpler. So when people get a type error, it's like, you know, posy finite double, which is a mouthful, but it's like kind of says what it is, not this with that. Or refined is actually a, you know, takes two type parameters and you usually use it in an infix notation. Um, and then the last one is I think there's some tricks you can do with uh, any vowels, like uh, if you try to uh, invoke absolute value on a posint. Um, ah. It actually won't compile because it's kind of a stupid thing to say. It's already positive. Whereas with the doing it at the type level, you really can't. It'll just call methods that are available on int. If you have a non-empty list, the plus plus on that actually could return an other another non-empty list, and I'm not sure they can. Like for methods that already exist, they can change the results like that. But that that's uh, it's very similar kind of thing of take things. I mean, put things into the uh, the type system. One more question. Uh, can I get? Yeah, sorry, I'll come. Yes. Yeah, you. Yeah, you, you, uh, I'll repeat the question. So it, it was um, about composability of different things. So the, the, the refine library can do that nicely. Um, we actually do have something called non-zero finite double, right? Uh, so yeah, it is less composable. Um, but like I said, I think that's, that's uh, what I'm trying to do is hit the 80% the of the time, like the 20% that, that is what 80% is what people use case. So, okay, so that's, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you.